Part 1. You'll hear someone booking transport for a trip. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 and 2. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 and 2. Good morning, Burnham Coaches. Sarah speaking. How can I help you? Ah, yes. Good morning. I'm a teacher at the Down Language School. We have a bit of a problem and I was wondering if you could help us out. What is the problem exactly? Well, we normally take our students on an excursion at the end of their course. But unfortunately, the coach firm we normally use has let us down. It seems they've gone out of business. I'm sorry to hear that. I suppose you are looking for a replacement. Well, yes. We won't need a very large coach, actually. There will be 30 students and four teachers. So that's 34 in all. And what dates did you have in mind? The last Saturday and Sunday of this month. That's the 28th and 29th. The 28th and 29th. Does that mean you are planning to stay somewhere overnight? That's right. Actually, we want to do the same excursion that we do every year. We usually visit Stonehenge, Salisbury and stay overnight in Bath. It's a historical tour, really. It sounds interesting. Let me just see what we have available. Oh dear, I'm afraid all our coaches are booked out for the 28th. It's the busiest time of the year for us, actually. I was afraid that would be a problem. But you have a coach available for the 29th? Yes, we do. And it's available for the 30th as well, if that's any help to you. I'm afraid not. Sunday is the last day. The students go home on Monday. I think we'll just have to change our plans a bit and leave out Salisbury. It's a shame, but I don't think we can fit in all three places in one day. So, you would like to book the coach for the 29th, visiting Stonehenge and Bath, is that right? Yes, I think so. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 3 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 3 to 10. Right, I just need a few details, sir. OK. My name is Paul Scott. S-C-O-T? It's double T, actually. I'm sorry. And it's the Down Language School. Could you give me the address for that, Mr Scott? Yes, it's Down House, Hill Street, Brighton. Do you need the postcode? No, that's not necessary but I do need a contact number. Of course. The number for the school secretary is 01273 512 634. You can contact her if you need to speak to anyone. Right. And what time would you like the coach to pick you up? Well, I think we'll have to make an early start. Would 7.30 be all right? Yes, no problem at all. What time do you want to be back? Oh, any time between 10 and 11 will be all right. Not later than 11, though. Right, I'll make a note of that. 11 p.m. latest. There's just one more thing I need to know. Presumably, you'll be visiting Stonehenge first. How long do you want to stay there? Well, we normally stay about an hour. The main objective of the excursion is for the students to see the Georgian architecture in Bath, really. Yes, Bath is lovely, isn't it? I was there myself a couple of years ago. I thought the Royal Crescent was absolutely stunning. I hadn't realised how large it is. 
Well, I think that's all I need to know, Mr. Scott. Thank you for booking with us. Just a minute. There's one thing you seem to have forgotten. How much will this cost? Oh, I'm terribly sorry. I was thinking about Bath. Just bear with me a moment. Yes, it's a round trip of 300 miles and a total time of 16 hours for the driver. For a 45-seater coach, that will be a total of £500, including tax and insurance. Do we have to have such a large coach? There are only 34 of us. We don't have any smaller coaches, I'm afraid. Oh, well. At least we won't be cramped for space. When do we have to pay? We require a 20% deposit to confirm the booking. I suggest that you do that as soon as possible, today if you can. The balance you can give to the driver if you're paying by cheque. Have the cheque made out to Burnham Coaches. I think that'll be all right. I will have to check this with the school accountant, but if all is well, I'll arrange for someone to bring you the deposit within the next two hours. That'll be fine, Mr Scott. Well, thank you very much indeed. Goodbye. Goodbye. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You are going to hear some announcements made to a group of people who are planning a trip to Greece. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 15. Good morning, everyone. I'm getting very excited about this trip to Greece, and I'm sure you are too. As you know, we didn't have all the details at our last meeting, but I can give them to you now. We'll leave London Gatwick Airport on British Airways next Wednesday. Please be sure to be at the airport by 6.30. I know it's early, but our departure time is 8.25 a.m. We're quite a large group and we don't want to have any hassles. Please be sure to have all your travel documents ready. We'll arrive in Athens at 2.25 in the afternoon and there'll be a vehicle there to meet us. It'll be a full-sized coach so everyone can travel together. We'll spend three full days in our hotel in Athens although we're only being charged for two nights accommodation, which is good news. The second day we'll go to the National Archaeological Museum to see the enormous collection of ancient Greek works of art, antiques, statues, a brilliant display. We'll eat out at a typical Greek restaurant on Thursday night. It's going to be a very busy time in Athens. Friday morning and afternoon we'll visit historic sites, but we have nothing planned for the rest of the day. On Saturday, we're off to the islands, the Greek islands of ancient myth and modern romance. Now the big news. At first, we thought we'd take the ferry, but we've been very lucky to secure a sailing boat, which is big enough for all of us. I'm really excited about this part of the trip because we'll see the islands to the best advantage and we'll be able to cruise around and sleep on board. We'll get off at different islands and for one part of the trip we'll have people playing Greek traditional music actually on board with us. Now I'll pass out a brochure with all the details. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20.
Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. A lot of work has gone into organising this tour and I'd like to thank in particular the travel agent who got us a really good deal and the people at the British Museum who offered us such good advice. Trips like this only happen because of the hard work of really expert people. As you know, we have planned a gathering for when we return. I have a list of things which the committee would like you to bring to the party. They are your pictures and something to eat for everyone to share. You are almost bound to have people ask what we have in common and why we're travelling as a group. I suppose the answer is that we're interested in learning about old societies and vanished cultures and we all enjoy travelling. Of course we enjoy fine food too, but that's not as important. Oh, I nearly forgot the last piece of information. You'll see there are labels which I have passed around for you to put on all your luggage. Could you fill them in, please? On the top line, please write Greek Tour. And on the lower line, write in block letters, I mean uppercase, the letters AA and the number 3. That's double A3. We need to have these labels clearly displayed to help the baggage handlers keep our luggage together on the different parts of our trip. So please don't take them off. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. You will hear somebody talking to a group of students about a university language center. Listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 24. Listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 24. Hi, I'm Katie Shaw and I work at the University Language Centre. Your tutor tells me you might be interested in using the centre, so I'm here at the college to explain a bit about it and, of course, to answer your questions. Where exactly is the centre? Is it near the college? It's actually on King's Road, just round the corner from here, in fact. Oh, I know it, yes. I wondered what that building was. Yes. What's there? Well, the library has about 4,000 books, pamphlets and transcripts to go with some of the 12,500 items on audio or video cassettes. These are at a wide range of levels of difficulty, covering language learning material in over 100 languages. There are also reference books without tapes, including dictionaries, grammars, grammar workbooks, vocabulary workbooks and model letters, as well as texts on academic writing and effective study habits, etc. Audio cassette workrooms are on the first floor, by the way. Do they get any foreign language press there too? Yes. The library subscribes to a number of European daily and weekly newspapers, including Le Monde from France, L'Espresso from Italy, and the weekly international edition of the Spanish paper El País. What about learning with computers? Can you do that there? Call, or computer-aided language learning, is available on the first floor. Um, how many PCs are there? Counting both Macintosh and PC platforms, there are nine at present. There are materials in over 15 different languages and new material and language categories are being added as library funds permit. The programmes cover verb drills, 
uh, grammar exercises, activities to accompany multimedia textbooks, pronunciation, translation, and some multimedia applications. The same hardware permits access to the internet with its many language learning and discussion sites. What about TV? That's a good way of learning a language too. Yes, definitely. We agree. So on the second floor of the centre, there are televisions to view live satellite television broadcasts in seven languages. Oh, which ones are they? Currently, we've got Arabic, French, German, Italian, Portuguese, Spanish and Russian. Turkish broadcasting can be viewed live on request. The centre records the news in French, German, Arabic, Italian, Japanese, Spanish and Russian. And English, too. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 25 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 25 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 25 to 30. Sounds great. How do we sign up? To avoid paying a fee, you need to go to the centre with a valid university ID card or a letter from your college or departmental administrator on headed paper indicating your status, length of stay and language requirements. Are there any forms to fill in? I'm afraid so. Mm. You do that at the ground floor reception desk. Your registration is for one academic year only and needs to be renewed annually. You should tell the librarian who you are on your first visit and you will need to take part in an induction to the library service, including the proper operation of the centre's computers, televisions, videos and so on. Can she help us choose the right materials too? Yes. The librarian can give advice and assistance in locating material, making best use of the texts and tapes and so on. Let her know which language you want to study and what, if any, knowledge of it you already have. Also, say what reasons you have for learning the language. Your answers will help the librarian help you make the best choice of books and tapes for your needs. She can also offer you advice on how much time is needed to make progress in the language and can offer suggestions on how to improve your language learning techniques. Can she copy tapes for us to take home, or can we borrow them? The library is a resource centre and reference library only. You can do as much self-study listening and reading work there as you want, but it's not possible to take home materials, that's to say, books or cassettes. And copyright law doesn't permit the library or its staff to make copies of cassettes for use by students outside the centre. All material must be used on the premises, I'm afraid. This ensures the materials are always available for students working on their own and not out on loan for long periods, which could harm users' progress. So, if we can't take books home, is it OK to photocopy them? The library staff will handle any photocopying, though international copyright law prohibits users from copying more than 5% of any one title in the academic year. You place a photocopy order with the librarian or an assistant and orders will be processed between 1 and 2 o'clock or after 5.30. How much does it cost? 10 pence per page. Payment is by photocopy card, which you can buy from the information desk on the ground floor. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Part 4. Part 4.
Complete the notes below. Use no more than three words for each answer. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Good afternoon. I'm glad you all found your way here. Now I'd like Dr. Wallace to introduce us to the Arboretum. Good afternoon. Although at first glance the Arboretum may look like a park, it is a research and teaching facility that also provides a place for people to develop a positive relationship with nature. When then University of Wisconsin-Madison purchased the land, mostly during the 1930s. Much of it bore little resemblance to its pre-settlement state. Instead, it had been turned into cultivated fields and pastures that had fallen into disuse. The university's arboretum committee decided, early on, to try to bring back the plants and animals that had lived on the land before its development. Though they may not have anticipated it at the time, the committee's foresight resulted in the Arboretum's ongoing status as a pioneer in the restoration and management of ecological communities. In focusing on the re-establishment of historic landscape, particularly those that predated large-scale human settlement, they introduced a whole new concept in ecology, ecological restoration. The process of returning an ecosystem or piece of landscape to a previous, usually more natural, condition. Madison was a fast-growing city in the 1920s. Fortunately, some leading citizens recognized the need to preserve open space for Madison's residents. Most of the Arboretum's current holdings came from purchases these civic leaders made during the Great Depression. In addition to inexpensive land, the Depression brought a ready supply of hands to work it. Between 1935 and 1941, crews from the Civilian Conservation Corps were stationed at the Arboretum and provided most of the labour needed to begin establishing ecological communities within the Arboretum. Efforts to restore or create historic ecological communities have continued over the years, with the result that the Arboretum's collection of restored ecosystems is not only the oldest, but also the most extensive such collection. In addition to these native plant and animal communities, the Arboretum, like most Arboreta, has traditional collections of labelled plants arranged in garden-like displays. These horticultural collections, featuring trees and shrubs of the world, are the state's largest woody plant collections. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
one. You will hear a man called Ken talking on the phone to a friend called Liz about holiday accommodation. First, you have some time to look at questions one to six. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions one to six. Hello? Hi Liz, it's Ken here. Hi Ken, nice to hear from you. Are you... This is just a quick call. But Mary and I have just been talking about our summer holiday. We haven't booked a place yet, and we've left it a bit late. We were just wondering if you know of any holiday rentals in your area. It's so nice there. Well, yes. I can think of two or three places that are very nice. What dates have you got in mind? The 10th of July to the 22nd of July. Oh, yes. That is quite soon, isn't it? Well, there's a place near here called Moonfleet. Is that M O O N F L E E T? That's right. It's quite a rural location, and it's next to the owner's house, but it's got fields all around it, so it's very pretty. Hmm, sounds okay. Can you tell me a bit more about it? Well, it's an annex to the owner's house, and it's an apartment with two bedrooms, and an open-plan living area. Well, I like the sound of it. Is there anything we might not like about it? Well, it's quite a distance from the nearest shops, that's all. OK. And... Well, I'll tell Mary, but I don't think she'd mind that. Do you know how you book it? You have to book on the internet. There's a web address. It's www.summerhouses. One word? Yes. Then dot com. You'll be able to look at a photograph on that. OK. And what about the others? Where are they? The second one I'm thinking of is called Kingfisher, and that's even more rural. It's a really beautiful location, in fact. It's by the river, and it's got nice views. It overlooks woodland on the other side. Is that an apartment? No, it's a three-bedroomed house, and that's got a dining room, as well as a separate living room and a kitchen. But I expect it's more expensive. You'll have to check the prices. Hmm. It's probably a bit bigger than we need. But our nephew might be joining us. We're not sure yet. How do you book Kingfisher? You have to phone the owner directly. Shall I give you the number? I've got it here in my phone book. It's 01752 669 218. Right. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 7 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 7 to 10. And you mentioned a third place? Yes, there's a house that my sister stayed in last year. It's called Sunnybanks. Nice name. And the location of that one is rather different. It's in the centre of a village, but it's a very small and quaint place. Did your sister like it? Oh, yes. It's by the sea, so her children really loved it. What's the accommodation like? I'm not sure about the number of rooms, because I haven't been in it myself, but I think she said it's quite spacious, and I know it's got its own garden. It's not very big, but it's not shared with anyone else, and it's supposed to be very pretty. Any snags? Problems? The only other thing I can think of is that there's nowhere for parking. The streets are too narrow, so you have to leave your car somewhere else, and then walk to the house. It's only about ten minutes away, but... OK. Well, I don't think it matters personally. 
How do you book it? There's an agent you have to contact. I don't know his details, but I can ask my sister and let you know tomorrow. Thanks, Liz. That'd be great. I'll talk to Mary and see what she says. Thanks for your help. That's okay, Ken. I'll speak to you again tomorrow. I hope you find what you're looking for. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 16. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 16. I'm here today with Helen Warner, who has been a vegetarian for many years and is going to talk a little about vegetarianism. Helen, the concept of vegetarianism seems to have interested a number of our listeners, who have sent in some questions. To begin, what made you want to become a vegetarian? Well, when I was 16, I had friends who were vegetarian and they introduced me to the idea. My parents were typical of their generation and ate meat at least three or four times a week, so I didn't really think about it too much until a few years later. It was while I was at university that I really thought about it and decided that it was unfair to eat meat when there are so many alternatives available. Is there anything you miss about not eating meat? Um, no, not really. As I said, there are so many substitutes available these days, perhaps the most important of which comes from the soya bean. Soya is so versatile and is the staple substitute for most vegetarians. So what about the nutritional value of vegetarian food? Isn't it true that there are some vitamins that you can't get from soya or vegetables alone? Surely people need these vitamins. Yes, that's correct. But actually there is only one vital vitamin that is only present in meat. That's vitamin B12. Most vegetarians are aware of the implication of this and actually take B12 supplement in the form of tablets. Of course, the way you cook vegetables is also very important in preserving vitamins. Many countries, particularly the UK, have a reputation for overcooking vegetables. Water-soluble vitamins, you know, where the vitamins are dissolved into the water, are often lost. Vitamin C is a common example. However, the loss of vitamins can be avoided by microwaving or steaming vegetables, which is what I do whenever I cook. Some people don't want to change their cooking habits too much, so if you do boil them, simply cut down on the cooking time. So a vegetarian diet is fairly healthy then? Oh yes. A lot of people believe that vegetarianism is unhealthy, but that's actually not the case. Vegetarians are actually considerably healthier than many meat eaters. Consider for a minute the health aspects of the incredible amount of meat this country and others like it consume. The statistics for beef eating, for example, are quite frightening. The world figure for beef consumption is slightly less than 11 kilograms per person each year. Yet in Europe, the average consumption is nearly double that at 21 kilos per person. And in the USA, it is even worse, with the average person eating 44 kilograms of beef every year. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 17 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 17 to 20. 
So are you suggesting that people stop eating meat altogether and everyone adopts a vegetarian lifestyle? No, not at all. Even in the healthiest diets, there is still a place for meat, but it should be eaten in moderation. Many nutritionists think of foods in terms of a pyramid, with the foods we can eat relatively freely at the bottom and the foods we should carefully restrict at the top. The majority of our diet should be composed of cereals, which would go on the bottom row of the pyramid. In this category could also be included such things as rice and pasta. Next, a good diet is followed by a roughly equal amount of vegetables and fruit. I have at least two servings a day of fruit and vegetables whenever possible. In decreasing quantities, you can then eat dairy foods, eggs, cheese, etc. Almost at the top of the food pyramid comes fish, carefully prepared of course, not dripping in oil or batter, and white meat. Chicken, for example, is a comparatively healthy meat, but again, a lot of this comes down to preparation methods. Right at the top of the pyramid come the ingredients of far too many Western meals, red meat and potatoes. It is particularly in that area that I would suggest moderation. Well, thank you very much, Helen. I'm sure that a lot of listeners are interested in your views. How could they find out more about the health benefits of vegetarian options? Well, there are lots of websites and books on healthy eating and vegetarianism, but it is always important to remember to consult your doctor before making any radical changes to your diet or lifestyle. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. The next important development in how history is recorded came with print. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. The next important development in how history is recorded came with print. In the 8th century, the Chinese invented paper and woodblock printing. Remember that up to this time, very few people could read and write, and so only a very small number of people could understand written history. Suddenly, many books appeared, and many more people learnt to read. In the 14th century, the first printing press was invented in Germany. This reduced how long it took to produce books. The new printing technique quickly spread to other parts of the world. More books appeared, and even more people learnt to read. The first printed newspaper appeared in 1605 and the first daily newspaper in 1702. Now, people could read news stories soon after the event happened, and every event was recorded and stored. The problem with newspaper history is that newspaper reporters could tell the stories they wanted to tell, and not necessarily the truth. Photography was the next important development – we generally agree that photography was born in 1839. Some of the earliest photographs that the public saw were images of the American Civil War. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30.
Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. People were shocked by the photographs of dead soldiers and for the first time saw the reality of war. By 1850, photographs appeared regularly in newspapers and people now expected the truth. At the end of the 19th century came the first motion picture camera. Soon, history was being recorded as moving images. In the 1930s, television brought moving images into people's homes. More and more people saw history as it happened, and more and more history was recorded. Today, of course, we expect that every event in the world is recorded. Satellite TV and the Internet allow people to watch any event, anywhere in the world, as it happens. It doesn't matter if the TV cameras are not there. People carry around mobile phones and can record any incident and then share it online. Families have their own video cameras and record their own history. Children now grow up watching their parents and grandparents on film. I'm sure you'll agree that the transition from storytelling to what we have today has been dramatic, and I hope that... That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. Nine. Listen to the second part of our lecture. As you listen, complete the notes below. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. River dance is not just an expression of self-confidence, a kind of culturally interesting pop song. It tells the story of a people through song and dance. It tells the story of the people whose spirit was broken by an event which occurred in the middle of the last century but continued to affect the society until 1961, the Great Famine. What is a famine? In 1840, the official population of Ireland was 8 million. They were largely poor and living in the countryside. They were beginning to have an interest in independence and perhaps had things been different, Ireland might have been independent much earlier. But there was a serious problem in the agricultural system. All crops were grown to pay the rent of the land and all that was grown to eat was the potato. This was fine until the potato crop failed, as it did from 1845 to 1848. The stories of what happened in those times live on in the popular culture of Ireland, and I won't tell them here, but the result was that two million people died or left the country by 1851. When you realise that the population continued to go down until 1961, you can realise what a disastrous effect this famine had on the people. Compared with China, imagine if the famine of 1960 reduced the population by a quarter and it kept falling to less than half of its pre-famine figure. Anybody with ideas left and went to England, America or Australia. The people left behind were broken by their experiences and, in effect, 
the famine and its consequences put an end to all serious development in the country until well into this century. The Irish in Ireland lost all hope and self-confidence, and much of our modern culture is about the sadness of that time and the sorrow of saying goodbye to those who left and left well into this century. Ireland has the highest emigration rate of any country in Europe for the last two centuries. We even have an expression for this saying goodbye. It is called the American Wake. It means the ceremony, like that of a funeral for someone going to America, because you will never see him or her again. Do you know why there is Irish music on the film Titanic? It is because most of the people killed were Irish. The leaving continued until the 1970s because independence in 1921 was followed by a civil war and an economic depression. Almost every family in Ireland has relatives abroad and up to the 60s in some places of a class of 30 graduating from high school all left. Along the west coast, closed up houses from that time falling into ruin are still common. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Counselor and two students, Joseph and Cara. First, you have some time to look at questions one to five. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions one to five. Hi, Joseph. How are you today? Fine, thanks. And Cara, how are you? Good. As we discussed on the phone earlier, I wanted to speak with both of you about the subjects you have chosen to study and how you are managing your time. OK? Yes. I think so. OK, so I'll start with Cara. You've been here for how many months now? I've been here for six months. How are you finding it? It's good. I'm enjoying the course. And what about life outside? Are you making friends and socialising? Not really. People here are quite closed. They don't talk to you. I see. So, what do you do after classes? I usually go home and study, and I might go out for a walk, but never really with anyone. Sometimes my roommate Louisa comes with me, but she always seems to be busy. How is this affecting your schoolwork? I don't think it is, but I miss home. Cara, what I suggest for now is that you look into joining one of the social clubs on campus. There are a variety of them. You can go camping, skiing, snorkeling, painting, dancing, reading, horse riding, rowing. There's a list on the school website. Have a look and work out which one you're interested in 
and which suits your timetable. You'll meet friends that way, and people who have the same career interests as you. As for the subjects you've chosen for a career in microbiology, I think you should look into dropping one of your subjects and picking it up again next year as a minor. You have a lot on your plate, and this will just cause great pressure. It doesn't mean that you aren't coping, but you're doing about 10 hours more than the average student a week. Think about it, and we can make another appointment to discuss it. When are you free? I have an hour free usually on Wednesdays at 11.30. OK, a y good. Come to my office at 11.45 and wait in reception. OK? OK, a y I'll see you then. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 6 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 6 to 10. Joseph, how are you finding the university? I love it. It's very different from home. Life here is very much focused on study and also s o c i a l i z i n g through sport. People have been very friendly and curious about my culture. So, you've managed to integrate well? I think so. I've joined the rugby team, something I'd never thought I'd be interested in. And how are your studies going? I think I am doing well. I have a few assignments that need some work, but overall, I'm coping. That's good. I'm happy that you're enjoying the university, but remember, don't let your schoolwork get too far behind, because it will pile up, and before you know it, you will be late handing in work. You know that there's a penalty for handing in work late? No, I didn't. You would have been told at the start of the course, during orientation. I don't remember. You need to remember these things. They are very important. You might be an excellent student, but if you consistently hand in work late, you'll be penalised and you might end up losing your degree over it. That's a lot of years of work, OK? a y Yes, I'll remember that. <laughs> and also remember that you have to attend 90% of your classes. So far, you have missed five tutorials. Be careful here. These could also cost you your degree. Is there any particular reason you missed these classes? I'd been training for our rugby match the night before and, well, we went out afterwards and I slept past my alarm clock. Joseph, I know this culture must be very different from where you come from, but please try and be a little more conservative with your time. I think maybe you should spend more time on your studies and less time on s o c i a l i z i n g The subjects you've chosen are intensive. I want you to spend three hours a night studying before you decide to do anything else. I'll make an appointment to see you in a month and we can assess your progress. I'll give you my business card. All my contact details are there. Call me in three weeks to organise another meeting. Do you have any questions for me? No, none. OK, a y I'll see you in a month. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. You'll hear a man talking about living and working on Trinidad. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15.
Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 15. Hi, I'm Steve Pinfold and I'm here today to tell you about my gap year, which I took about 20 years ago. Unlike many students these days who go travelling or get some work experience between school and university, I decided to do something completely different after finishing my degree. I applied to work for a charity organisation. What it does is it sends people with particular skills to countries where those skills are needed. Apart from having some experience teaching English to summer school students, I didn't have any particularly useful skills, I thought, but luckily I was still accepted. I had to find the money for the flight, but you get free accommodation. I stayed with a family of five. And you do get paid, but not much. It's a bit like pocket money, enough to get by. I worked in an orphanage and taught English at a local school. Where was I? Well, originally, I was going to be sent to a village in India, but at the last minute, the organisation decided to send me to Trinidad. Now, this is a fascinating place. It's an island in the Caribbean. Well, in fact, the country is actually two islands. The smaller one is called Tobago, which is connected somehow to the word tobacco. Anyway, there I was, a young white guy living and working on an island which is mostly a mixture of descendants from Africa and India. The Africans were originally brought over as slaves, and the Indians came later as indentured workers. That means they agreed to come for a specific time, but many of them stayed. There are also some Trinidadians of Chinese and British origin, though the native inhabitants were basically wiped out by colonialization. I myself felt completely accepted and had the time of my life. The language everyone speaks is English, so there was no problem for me there, but some concepts don't quite translate. They're pure Trinidadian. There's the term liming, for example, which means sitting around watching the world go by. Also, there's the famous carnival, when the whole island is taken up in playing mass. For a whole month, around February or March, it depends when Easter is, everyone's busy preparing costumes, practicing calypsos, soca and steel pan music, and most importantly, partying. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. When the actual official carnival starts, it's days of 24-hour dancing in the streets. In Trinidad, it's called whining. You've probably seen this sort of thing on TV, in the more famous carnival in Rio, or even at the Notting Hill Carnival in London. Many people join bands, each one of which has a theme. For example the sea or jungle fever, and they have costumes designed and made to go with the theme. These can cost a thousand dollars for the king and queen of each band. They're incredible. The whole city is a non-stop party zone full of colour and sound. It's serious too. The bands are in competition and the winner gets a million dollars. Sorry, I got a bit carried away with those memories. Back to my real job there. The orphanage was called St. Augustine's, and that's also the name of the place where it was, St. Augustine, a town just outside the capital city, Port of Spain. I didn't have any particular job description, just to be with the children and tell stories, sing songs and play games. Oh, and we also went camping in the jungle once. <laughs> I could tell you a few stories about that particular escapade. Every time I arrived at the gate, 
kids would come running towards me, shouting, with big smiles on their faces. The younger children seemed fascinated by my blonde hair and loved to touch it as if it was something miraculous. The English teaching I did two days a week in a primary school for six to 11-year-olds. The kids may have been poor, but they all wore neat and clean uniforms and were so respectful and enthusiastic. I've now been teaching for many years in different countries, and I still think those were the best students I've ever taught. What else did I do while I was there? I swam a lot. Can you imagine what it's like swimming with dolphins and with pelicans diving into the sea right next to you? More seriously, I trained to be a Samaritan. That's someone who listens and supports people who have problems with their lives. Overall, what I took from the experience was a sense of being in another culture, or rather cultures. As humans, we all share many characteristics, but we express ourselves in various ways. In Trinidad, there are lots of different communities and religions, and so many different kinds of festival to see. Hindu, Muslim, Christian, as well as some rather mysterious African traditions. There are quite a few Rastafarians, too. Trinidad is, as Americans are fond of saying of their own country, a melting pot, where everybody is greeted warmly. Go and see for yourself. I'm not sure how it's changed since I was there, but I'd love to find out. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You are going to hear a lecture. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. I'd like to introduce Rebecca Bramwell, an artist and illustrator who has come along today to talk to you all about getting your first job or commission as an artist. Over to you, Rebecca. Thank you for inviting me. I remember when I graduated back in 1983, I was very excited about getting my first commission. My degree was in fine art and I'd worked long and hard to get it. I was an enthusiastic student and I never found it difficult to find the incentive to paint. I think as a student... London being settled by the Romans explains their lust for blood. By about AD 200, the administration of Britain was divided in two. York became the capital of Britannia Inferior and London of Britannia Superior. Around the same time, the city also acquired its famous walls, probably about 20 foot high. Why did they build such high walls? It was a protective measure which may have been due to civil war, initiated when Governor Claudius Albinus tried to claim the imperial crown in Rome. Was paganism still predominant then? Yes, but Christianity appears to have reached the province at an early date, and only a year after the religion became officially tolerated in the empire, London had its own bishop, Restitutus, who is known to have attended the imperial council of Al. You really delve deep. I think you'll do well on your tutorial paper. Good luck, David. Thanks.
Good morning, all. Welcome to our regular lecture on health issues. This series of lectures is organised by the Students' Union and is part of an attempt to help you stay healthy while coping with study and social life at the same time. It's a great pleasure to welcome back Ms. Mary Kirk, who is a professional health advisor and physical education officer. Thank you, Peter, for the introduction. It's a pleasure to be back. Today we're going to discuss the benefits of exercise. University life is hectic and stressful. It also involves a lot of sedentary work, that is, sitting for many hours at a time. What I'd like to focus on is how to approach exercise, not only from the aspect of health benefits, but also as a form of stress relief. I know it's hard to organise your time around studies and socialising, but you can socialise while exercising. If you have an hour free in the morning, afternoon, or evening, it would be a good idea to get together with your friends and create a sports team. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions twenty-six to thirty. Now listen and answer questions twenty-six to thirty. The grounds of the university are ample enough to support every student's need to become active. There are also readily available facilities at your disposal, such as a football field, tennis, and badminton courts. There's also a swimming centre, and within that building is a gymnasium. With a variety of programs such as aerobics and weight training, if the idea of attending one of these facilities seems daunting, then you can walk along the river. Oh, and that reminds me, the university also offers rowing. If there is a sport that you're interested in that's not on offer, you can approach either your student union representative, or speak with sports administration manager, Mr. Lawrence Cavendish. Now I want to talk about why exercise is beneficial physically and emotionally. The obvious results are physical. You can keep fit by using muscles that ordinarily don't get used in the classroom. The health benefits are astronomical. You'll live longer, be happier, and look good. By building muscle, you strengthen your bones, a definite advantage for women in their later stages of life. As women are prone to osteoporosis, it also strengthens your heart. Yes, don't forget your heart is a muscle, and the more exercise you do and the harder you work, the more blood is pumped from your heart to your brain. Now this brings me to the psychological advantages of exercise. When we are active, endorphins are released into our brain. An endorphin is a chemical that is released when your heart rate is pumping beyond its normal capacity. It's the same as adrenaline. You can actually feel when endorphins kick in. You feel a rush, almost a high. The benefits of this are numerous. Your brain works at peak capacity for a longer period of time. Your awareness is maximized, and the fatigue you usually feel at four o'clock in the afternoon. Will be non-existent. In one word, exercise makes you sharp. Now, I'm not saying that you should overdo exercise, because too much of anything can be dangerous. But if you think about your daily routine, you spend about six hours a day in lectures and another two or more hours studying. That's a long time to be sitting, and that is a long time for your body not to be moving around. So try and find at least one hour a day to get some exercise. If you can't fit in one hour a day, try one hour every second day or half an hour a day. You will see rewards instantly. You'll feel great and look great. This I can promise you. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now it turns to part four. Part four. You will hear part of a lecture about how adults and babies communicate. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Hi, I'm Emma Bailey and today I'm going to be talking baby talk. Hopefully you'll find the subject interesting rather than infantile. I'd like to start by getting you to imagine a scenario. You're in an office or at a family gathering when a mother comes in with her young baby. Like everyone else, you want to see the mother and baby, and you probably want to talk to the baby. How do you do this? What kind of language do you use? Recent research has shown that adults all talk to babies in similar ways. They repeat phrases over and over again in a high-pitched sing-song voice with long vowel sounds. And if they ask questions, they exaggerate their intonation. Researchers have discovered that this kind of language, which they have called motherese, is used by adults all over the world when they talk to babies. And according to a new theory, motherese forms a kind of framework for the development of language in children. This baby talk, so the theory goes, itself originated as a response to another aspect of human evolution, walking upright. In contrast to other primates, Humans give birth to babies that are relatively undeveloped. So, whereas a baby chimpanzee can hold on to its four-legged mother and ride along on her back shortly after birth, helpless human babies have to be held and carried everywhere by their upright mothers. Having to hold on to an infant constantly would have made it more difficult for the mother to gather food. In this situation, researchers suggest, Human mothers began putting their babies down beside them while gathering food. To pacify an infant distressed by this separation, the mother would talk to her offspring and continue her search for food. This remote communication system could have marked the start of motherese. As mothers increasingly relied on their voices to control the emotions of their babies and later the actions of their mobile juveniles, words emerged from the jumble of sounds and became conventionalised across human communities, ultimately producing language. Not all anthropologists, however, accept the assumption that early human mothers put their children down when they were looking for food. They point out that even modern parents do not do this. Instead, they prefer to hold their babies in their arms or carry them around in slings. They suggest that early mothers probably made slings of some kind, both for ease of transportation and to keep their babies warm by holding them close to their bodies. If this was the case, they would not have needed to develop a way of comforting or controlling their babies from a distance. It's not only anthropologists, but also linguists who challenge this explanation for how language developed. They say that although the motherese theory may account for the development of speech, it does not explain the development of grammar. Nor, they say, does it explain how the sounds that mothers made acquired their meaning. Most experts believe that language is a relatively modern invention that appeared in the last 100,000 years or so. But if the latest theory is right, baby talk, and perhaps fully evolved language, was spoken much earlier than that. We know that humans were walking upright one and a half million years ago, 
This means that mothers may have been putting their babies down at this time and communicating with them in motherese. We can be sure that this is not the end of the story, as anthropologists and linguists will continue to investigate the origins of this most human of abilities, language. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers. I've been driving this train Years in this lane There's no stopping this flame Cause I came to the game And I changed it to play How I like rearranged it To my own domain Yeah I got what it takes Made lots of mistakes Taking shots Skipping breaks Feeling lost Feeling great Popping off Singing straight Never stop Never changed All the squad here to play And I've got something to say Yeah I work hard each and every day I get lost in the words I say I don't push pause No I push play I want to 